Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I'm tempted to begin this address in one long and terrifying distinguished line with words such as, it is traditional on occasions such as these. My father started one such with, it's traditional on occasions such as these, to begin by protesting one's inadequacy for the task ahead and then to continue by proving it. <laughs> So I carried out some research to find out what were the traditional topics for the Master's Address and divined two surprisingly consistent threads. One was focused on RDI-ness, who are we, where are we going, what is our relevance, what are we for, what can we do, what should we do, should we do anything? Followed by um, how about um, some of which over time some of these ideas have been adopted. The other thread I can best describe as a series of meditations on the definitions of design, followed by what skills, attributes, attitudes, experience, etc., make a good designer. I could claim that I was born with a Dieter Ram spoon in my mouth, except that suggests that my childhood house was modern, or even modern, which it wasn't at all. It was an eclectic, I can only describe it thus, um, perhaps typical of the moment, or perhaps typical of a social background. Although we did have a Dieter Rams uh, radiogram in the corner, most of the objects I grew up with were trawled from junk shops and um, markets. Most things repaired with that wonderful stuff called secotine. This is my uh, Festival of Britain mug, glued together with secotine. So I started as a glue sniffer. <laughs> Both parents then were architects and designers of uncompromisingly modern, um, not avant-garde, but modern work, houses, interiors, products, and exhibitions. But everything at home was carefully chosen second-hand. They didn't believe that good design had to mean new. They had set up the School of Interior Design at the RCA after the war and ran it for 25 years, creating a generation of interior environmental designers where before there hadn't really been any. And the daily conversations at home were therefore also off-cuts about design, business of design, teaching of design, doing of design, judging of design. And as children's understanding of conversation and off-cuts allowable to be unreliable, uh, my comprehension of the matters of the day were probably highly confused. However, I did gather up the underlying script of all of these discussions, which was that design was a profession, and that meant a vocation, a calling, the purpose of which is to supply disinterested counsel and service to others. A very nice definition, I think, but service being the key word. So they frowned upon people who touted for business, who sought publicity, and very annoyingly for us children, those who made money out of it. <laughs> they would have subscribed to one of my predecessors here, Alfred Reed's definitions. Designing is a modest, decent way of contributing to the happiness of the world, and it is no more and no less than that. Their eclecticism fitted this approach well, because although they saw design as a crucial but nonetheless modest activity, they knew that for design to be any good or useful, it required nurturing and lots of encouragement. And one of their great strengths was their genuine dedication to the encouragement of creative endeavor and their deep-seated belief that it was important. I cannot claim I remember very much about um, the Festival of Britain, a momentous event in our household made manifest by the absence of father except when he had chicken pox, but it did put design on the list of things for the nation to consider. He was criticised for building something that was not serious enough, but he didn't do dogma or manifestos or even much theory. As I said, he only had one theory, that the arts are vital and in order to encourage you had to be a tolerant, pluralistic, because that's how the world is and everyone should have a voice. In the 50s, simple days when there were no design magazines and producers said that it wasn't possible to put architecture on or design on TVs, no one was interested, there was nonetheless a consensus about what was good design and what was bad design. It was almost black and white, 
represented, of course, by our old friend, the Design Council, TAG. And then in the 60s, when sex was invented, suddenly everything was possible. The relationship between design and politics was finally acknowledged, and whilst doors were closed on sit-ins, others opened onto the landscape of Dolce Vita. We still had an industry, not that they listened very much, and creativity, innovation, radicalism was suddenly something of value. The design schools were properly organized and funded, seen as places about education, and produced as many musicians as designers and artists, and these schools have given us the extraordinary reputation as a creative hub. That then was my grounding, and I don't remember when I took the decision to become a designer, but it just seemed to be the obvious thing to do. I began in the furniture industry and learned much of my living by teaching, in order to learn, of course, um, before forming my partnership with Roger Mann, RTI, in 1984, and the start a few years later of 16 years of working in museums. And one of the particular pleasures this election gives me is the fact that I'm the first master to represent exhibition museum design since Misha Black, who was master here in 1973. And I'd like to share, albeit briefly, why this field of work is so interesting and difficult and time-consuming and rewarding and frustrating and underrated, underpaid and under-discussed. Um, I'm not convinced that many people really know what museum is, so I shall try and explain it to you by giving an example of the sort of briefing conversations that we have. Please take our objects and display as many of them as you can in such a way that children, parents, school groups, OAPs, disabled, foreigners, the illiterate, the brilliant, the tired, the energetic, the knowledgeable, and the ignorant, and the happy, and the sad, can all have a really interesting time looking at them. <laughs> we want this to be a place for scholars, uh, oh, and we want it to be a place for the dine and out. Oh, no problem, say we. Um, we understand that you have um, a limited budget, that you'd like to fill the place with AV and smart technology. We understand that you want to encourage people to feel close to the objects, and it's vital that they don't touch anything. And we also understand that you're understaffed and that running a museum is desperately hard, and that somehow we have to find a way of using the assets you have, which are generally a motley selection of objects brought together as a result of obsessions of people long since gone, housed in an expensive building with impossible circulation routes and not enough lavatories. And we also understand that you want to quadruple your visitor numbers because if you don't, funding will cease, the place will close, the objects will be dispersed or put into store and somehow a piece of something very precious will die. Because they're so different from each other, contemporary brain science and bravery medals are really not the same thing. It's hard to generalize about museums, but I think one thing one can say is that to visit them forces us to re-examine our prejudices, assumptions, memories, perspective and knowledge, and our perception of human endeavor, human thought, and human worth. Museums can change the way we behave and see the world. These are three-dimensional places where three-dimensional connections can be made. Good museums can inspire visitors to be more resourceful, to have confidence in their capabilities and their ability to create and collaborate. Once viewed as an irritating interruption to scholarship and a source of silly questions, the visitor is suddenly important. They're now even thought to be interesting and the museums are now seeking a dialogue with them. As designers of these places, we sit somewhere between the museum, represented by the curator and the visitor. Like taxi drivers, we accept almost any topic in our back seat. And we tend to keep our light on as the projects are susceptible to disappearing. We've looked at dinosaurs, portrait miniatures, brain science, nuclear power, contemporary design, small children, the future. The museum designer's privilege, and all designers have their privileges, is having to learn. And we have to learn and understand in order to do our job. And now for my two forks and the setting out of my master's table. You will have noticed that my forks are eating forks not like the two-pronged ones in the proverbial road. But like those on the road, they are here because they're representing choice. My first fork, then, is about us as RDIs, 
and what we want to do with our role as a faculty within the RSA. Designers have to be multifaceted people, and our task is to enlighten and to be enlightened, to learn as well as to teach. Hence the appropriateness of the title faculty. The current agenda of the RSA to promote design as a visible tool for social good fits most of us like a glove. And our host desire to see us at voluntary and visible participants in their projects and initiatives has never been under dispute. And the 75 Days Initiative is a clear example of this. So my first fork would be a series of choices that we shall have to make about how we enhance that role. My second fork is about us as RDIs and what we want to do with ourselves. I'm saddened and maybe embarrassed by the fact that I personally know so few fellow RDIs. We're a weird bunch, from lone practitioners to the directors of large companies, pleaters of fabric to the suspenders of bridges. Between us, we think and care about propellers, the alphabet, hats, taps, cups, film, sound, sustainable energy, torches, stamps, shops, opera, puppets, an unwieldy group of brilliant people with strong opinions, mad ideas, and a commitment to solving problems. Although I'm not proposing that we are cohesive enough or want to be cohesive enough to speak with one voice, I would like to suggest that the faculty becomes regarded as an active network out of which we can hand on knowledge. Most of us have taught in design schools, and some of us still do. Some of us play an active role in the RCA mentoring scheme, and some of us are contributing to the RSA Academy program. The RDI Summer School, currently lying dormant, has passed through various incarnations, but I hope to be able to relaunch this as soon as possible, albeit in an adjusted guise, as this offers a very clear platform for RDIs to share their experiences and, importantly, their different points of view. And I remind you that this is not about us as one voice. It is the opposite. But as the design schools begin to default, young designers need to have access to, wide voice, to wise voices. So one of the forks on my table will be concerned with this. I will be seeking ways with you to find, to, to, to find ways that we can contribute from experience as practitioners and as teachers to a collective pool of ideas on how the next generation of designers might be educated. Most of us had, have had more interesting journey into design than I've had. And there are many out there who could be encouraged by those stories. And as storytelling is my trade, I'm keen to collect these and to share them. So you'll be hearing from me. Probably more than two forkloads, but one thing tends to lead to another. And I set off on this new journey with slight trepidation. And I hope during the next two years to edge these forward things forwards just a little, because I'm very realistic about what's possible. But as Gracho Marx said, those are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. <laughs> Thank you very much.